Hello, this is Plus TV Africa, where big stories live. My name is Elsie Godwin, and this is One on One, where we bring you very interesting personalities and strong people from all around the world. On this episode, we're One on One with Ines Paul. She's the editor in chief, Dosha Vele. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so being the editor in chief for a platform like DW, it's not every time you get to see um, women in such positions everywhere in the world. Mm. How did you rise to that position? Mm. That is actually a good question because especially in my country, in Germany, there's still very little women in these high positions. Um, you know, I think what, um, what brought me there was my true commitment to journalism. Uh, you know, I started as a radio reporter, then I made my way up and we at Deutsche Welle, we really uh, want to provide the best journalism. So we need people in charge who know what they are doing. Our director general also used to work as a journalist for a long time. So I think it's good to have people in management uh, who are true journalists when it comes to journalism after all. Okay, so you used um, true commitment for mm -hmm. journalism. And um, of course, when the people in the management team speak to those that are coming up in journalism, they usually tell them you have to be really committed in this line of work or it would not um, be very favorable. So how would you define um, true commitment for journalism? I think um, the most important thing is to stay curious, mm. you know, to really want to learn something not to preach your opinion and tell the world what you think, but to really go out and to talk to people and listen and report honestly and deeply what concerns people and how reality looks like. Hmm. Okay, so um, what would you say women should do to get to this position? I mean, you're there, it's not easy, right? But what would you advise? What um, Ethic, ethics would you want to see in other women to give them more chance in order to be in this managerial position? We should believe in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Why should men be better than we? So that's the first thing. And I think what really, and that also helped me in my career, I always had mentors, strong women, strong men, uh, whom I could trust, you know, whom I could share my concerns with, with, with my fears, my questions. And that's good to have someone on your side, you know, mm. with whom you can talk journalism and also power struggles so get yourself someone get yourself a buddy who mm -hmm. helps you through mm -hmm. the power struggle i want you to touch on that so what does that mean power struggle in the media space how it was like you know it's it's just like you have someone who embraces your thoughts and uh um, someone who is also critical with you, who, who helps you to overcome weaknesses, who helps you to come better uh, uh, content-wise. Um, so I think you should really have an open and honest relationship. That's what I would suggest and that's what I, that would be my advice. Hmm. What is your definition of feminism? Um, all people are equal. It doesn't matter if they are women or men, if they come from Africa or from uh, Europe. So my uh, uh, definition of feminism is more than gender equality. I think we should really fight for, the, for equality of all people. Uh, maybe in the 70s or so in my country, really we fought uh, for women's rights, we fought for the right uh, that women could vote and all these things earlier on. But now I think as a true feminist, I should fight for, the, for equal rights for everybody in this whole world. Hmm. Okay, let's talk about DW. What is the used concept for the platform? Mm -hmm. So maybe I can say a couple of sentences about Deutsche Welle. So mm -hmm. we are Germany's international broadcaster and we broadcast in 30 languages all around the world. Uh, we have a couple of TV channels in Arabic, in Spanish, uh, German and English. And our English news channel is the biggest one. And our idea is really to tell the, the story behind the news. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if something happens, if breaking news happens or big political events take place, we try to tell uh, the story behind this, is, this event. What, what will it mean? What will the outcome be? what uh, came before that event, you know, how, what came together so that happened. So it's really more than the actual news news. It's really like the deeper, deep reported story mm. behind it. So in telling the stories behind the news, what are the peculiar challenges you mm. would say um, is faced actually in underdeveloped countries? Mm. So I think the biggest challenge really is to be there 
to have as many colleagues in the field. So that's what, what we are doing right now. We extend our uh, uh, numbers of offices in, in the country. We have an office here in Lagos, for example. We just opened an office in, in Delhi uh, with five different languages. We opened an office in Beirut. So I think the only way, especially now with, with social media and all this fake news stuff going on, we really have to have as many people out there and also work with regional partners, you know, uh, f with those who are trustworthy and are fighting for the same cause. Uh, because that would make our report, or this is make our reporting much stronger. Mm. Talking about fake news, what's your understanding of a properly done report? Mm. Go out, talk to people. Uh, don't be afraid to get answers to your questions which you didn't expect and mm. maybe from a political standpoint don't even like. Be honest with yourself, you know, just report what you are seeing and then verify the information you get. So our rule, for example, is we always need to have at least two sources if we report a fact. Mm -hmm. And we just started a new verification unit so we can verify pictures. Are they really true? Are they faked? We can verify user-generated content which reaches us and which we sometimes need to use for our reports. For example, when it comes to Syria, to Aleppo, where we don't have people on the ground. So we use content from viewers sent to us, but we need to verify, is this really filmed where they say it is filmed? Are these the people they mention uh, who are in the picture or in the footage? Are these really the people they, are talk, uh, they, they say they are? So that's becoming more and more important, I think, to have these, really these units who have the skills uh, to verify the data, the information we get. Mm, so far, how much effective would you say the verification process has been in order to tackle fake news? Mm. It's difficult because once fake news is spread, it's really hard to get it back. And we have some political leaders who, who use that in their advantage, advantage. They use Twitter and other social media channels to put out information which isn't really true, which isn't reported. Um, I think the best answer is to build a brand which is trusted by its audience. Mm -hmm. So therefore we have to be extra careful. And I think we also have to be very honest when we made a mistake to correct it on air, on our social media platforms to say, listen, that was wrong. We apologize. Don't try to hide it. Mm -hmm. Nothing will be ever forgotten anymore. Mm -hmm. So do really deep reporting, be honest and verify and also have a good uh, understanding of correction, correcting your own mistakes. Hmm. All right, let's go on a quick break. But when we come back, we'll definitely carry on this conversation. Welcome back. This is still one on one on Plus TV Africa. Before we went on that break, you said something about politicians even using social media to tweet something that is not true and then it spreads. So we are in the digital age. Everybody has access to, or everybody have access to social media. So how do you balance the crave for fast news and also making sure your reporting is deep? Mm -hmm. That is also a very good question. Um, on the one hand, you have to be fast. If something happens, you have to send out your alerts. But um, I think it's, it is even more important to be right than be fast. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you put out some alerts which, which are wrong for a couple of times, you really destroy your trustworthiness, your credibility. And that is the most important value in news organizations have these days. So you have to be very careful with your sources. And I think what you also could do, if it's not 100% verified, you could say regarding to this or that source. Uh, because sure, we want to be one of the first to report big things happen, but always make it very clear where you get your information from. Mm, and the best thing would be to have really your own people on the ground, but you can't have them all around the world. So it's also good to have reliable partners, you know, whom you could call and say, for example, now as we know each other, I mean, we have someone in Lagos, but if you wouldn't have someone, I could call you or your news organization and say, listen, is this true? Is this explosion happening or whatever, this tsunami? Um, and then you would be my source to confirm it. Okay. Do you think social media um, has made journalism a bit more difficult? Yes and no. Um, on the one hand, I think it's challenging us uh, to be better you know, and to engage more with our audience. 
uh, like 10 years ago or so, we just, you know, we were kind of, yeah, we could, we could decide whether to report on that event or not. And now someone will report. So we are not so, in that regard, we are not so powerful anymore. Uh, and we have to take our audience more serious. We have to engage with our, our audience. Um, we were at the uh, uh, social media week and I talked to many young kids there and they really want to, to get engaged, you know. If, if we put out a news report, they want to be able to get to start a conversation with us. So that is a new challenge, but I think that's also a new possibility, mm -hmm. new opportu opportunity, I shall say. Okay, let's talk about the interest of DW in the African story. Recently, mm -hmm. you just launched the second season of African Roots. Mm -hmm. So why this particular interest in telling our story? Because we we have a report of you saying that it's important especially for the people that are also telling the story. So what is the drive about? So African Roots, it's a, a comic series. We have launched 25 uh, uh, parts uh, telling the story of, of interesting and important African figures and leaders. And we just launched our second series with another 25 portraits. Why are we doing that? You know, we actually got the idea on a panel. Um, someone told us, uh, an African woman, you know, I know much more uh, about American or, or German or European leaders. I know more about uh, John F. Kennedy than my people. And that's not good. I mean, that's a, it's a pity. It's a waste. So that gave us the idea to start this series. But it's not that we as Germans tell you Africans about your people. Uh, we are more like a facilitator, you know, we, we give the platform and we work very closely together uh, with African scientists, journalists, knowledgeable people uh, to, to do these pieces about the African leaders. I think it's fascinating to learn about the history of your country, not only for Africa itself, but also for the rest of the world. Mm. So what's the partnership with Comic Republic? How, why did you choose Comic Republic? And because why the medium? Why comic? Um, first of all, they are great. It's wonderful to work with them. They're very professional, uh, very reliable and just wonderful people. Uh, and why comic? Because uh, Africa is such a young continent. I mean, 77% are 30 years and younger. So I think we as, as media broadcasters, we have to find new ways to reach this next generation. And I think comics is a good way to do that. You can tell complicated stories in a way which, uh, which is re uh, easy to understand. That's one reason. The other reason is, as we are focusing on, uh, on, on leaders and interesting people, uh, like 100 or 100 or 200, 250 years back, there isn't any footage. There's no video clips, there aren't any pictures. So comics is a good way, you know, to show someone whom you have hardly any, any illustration from. Let's talk about the medium of distribution, radio and social media. Why radio and why social media? Oh, because this has the biggest reach. I mean, I still do believe in linear television, uh, but what we do at Deutsche Welle and what you guys probably do as well, we try to use our content on several platforms. You know, for example, this video we could also broadcast on YouTube or Facebook. So um, that's what we do with with seventy seven percent. It's a format which takes place in our television. Uh, shows, but also can be used on social media. So I think we have to reach out to different platforms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in working closely with um, Africans and Nigerians, what would you say about the people? Um, it's, I mean, African people, it's hard to say, right? It's such a, it's such a huge continent. Okay. I mean, there is no such thing as the African. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I really, I really do... Uh, I do love the intensity of the young people, how they really are taking ownership of their future. Uh, and this is something what Deutsche Welle really would like to support with our reporting. You know, our, our goal is really to deliver free information on the one hand, from the world to the world, but also facilitate uh, platforms as we do with uh, African Roots or 77%. Um, I love, I love the energy, I love the, the interest, I, I love the commitment to the continent, you know. Um, I met so many younger Africans uh, who, who want to stay home. It's such a mistake to think 
everybody wants to leave and go somewhere else because Europe is so much better or the United States. No, uh, I, I love to get this feeling we are committed to our continent and we want to make this thing work. And uh, we as, as Deutsche Welle yeah, try to, to do everything we can to support uh, mm -hmm. this interest in building democracies. I like that you said there's nothing like the Africa, like there are diverse people and of course there's so many countries in Africa. How do we begin to tell the stories to create that unity, but understand that there's also a level of individuality in it? Because I mean, you watch movies in Hollywood and you hear them say, we're going to Africa, and you wonder, where exactly in Africa are you going? Or mm. this happened in Africa. So how do we begin to tell the stories to have a better image of what Africa really represents? That's a great topic, you know. it's really boiling down to the question of identity. Who are we? Mm -hmm. You're first of all maybe a, a woman living in, in Lagos, then you're Nigerian, then you are whatever, Sub-Sahara, mm -hmm. West African, then mm -hmm. you are African, then you are a person of the world. So uh, I think the, uh, we as journalists, we just have to tell the story. We have to tell the American audience, hey, there is no such thing as an African. It's so different if you live in West Africa or in South Africa or in North Africa. Be specific in our reporting. Be specific in describing the circumstances, the political uh, situation, the economical situation, uh, the cultural differences in music, in food, in clothes. So I think we should really do as much reporting as possible from the ground and spread these stories, tell these stories to the world. And that's what Deutsche Welle does, because we have also a huge audience in the United States, in Europe, in, in Asia. So when we do a report about Lagos, for example, it is watched in, 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 in Los Angeles. So, and I think that's what we have to do. Tell the stories, go out, and tell what's really going on. Okay, let's go on a very quick break. But when we come back, we'll carry on this conversation. Welcome back. This is still one on one on Plus TV Africa, and I still have Ines Paul with me here. So, um, before we went on that break, you were saying something about telling the African story and ensuring that we do not take away the cultural diversity that we have, but understand that we're united. However, the Europeans see themselves as a united front, but we have the Germans and the other people, right? But they still push one um, European, but. <laughs> In Africa, the South Africans want to be different. Nigerians want to be seen as the very different giant of Africa. You know, how do we begin to bring this unity even in the diversity? Hmm, that's a very tough one. You know, the unity in, in Europe is kind of uh, fading. I mean, we saw the Brits leaving the European Union, the so-called Brexit. Uh, we have uh, huge conflicts between different uh, uh, European countries when it comes to freedom of press, for example. So the unity as, isn't as strong as it should be on the one hand. On the other hand, I think there is an understanding of a, a European uh, identity. So we are Europeans after all. Some uh, countries might feel more, more strong about that than others, but it is, it's never ever a given. So we, I think we still, we in Europe, we still have to fight for that. And I think if, if you would, Europe would fail, all these little small countries and bigger countries, uh, they would really lose a lot, a lot of, lot of strength. But unfortunately, it's not as bright as it might seem from, from your perspective. We do have some struggles as well. Hmm. So how was that identity built? Because mm -hmm. the identity still makes it possible for you to hold on to something to say we mm. are European. So how do we begin to build our own identity in this part of the world? So, um, I mean, I think one big step was like having the same currency. We all pay in euros now. You know, mm. when I grew up, we had different currencies, the Deutsche Mark and the French franc. Uh, and the Spanish pesos, but now we all pay with one money. Mm. This is probably important. Uh, then we opened our borders. There weren't any border controls anymore. Uh, this has changed a little bit again, but that is true. So you can really travel from one country to the other. Mm -hmm. You can work as a European in any other European country without any special work permit. That also helps. Um, 
But I also think there is kind of a cultural definition. We kind of share uh, some history. We have a lot of history in common. And that also helps us to feel as Europeans. Mm. But again, it is a struggle. It's not a done deal. Mm. There is an ongoing conversation uh, regarding ECOWAS using the countries under the ECOWAS using one currency. Mm -hmm. Do you think that would really help us as Africans or would it further create a level of um, diversity? I don't know if, if the money issue is, is so important in, 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 on your continent uh, and it's so much bigger. I mean, it's such a huge place. Uh, you have all these different languages. I mean, so did we, or so do we in, in Europe as well. I, you know, I mean, I think what really helps if you um, define a common goal. So, for example, in Europe it really is uh, the commitment we never want to have a war in Europe again. We had horrible wars. Unfortunately, the last two big ones initiated by my country, by Germany, but we are committed that we want to keep peace on our continent. That could be, I mean, I don't know what your common goal would be, but I think that should, could be something. Then sure, I think that should be everyone's common goal. It should be indeed. Mm -hmm. And then econ economic growth, it's very important for, for your continent, as it is everywhere. Uh, so what uh, Europe does, the poorer countries get helped by the richer countries. I don't know if this would be possible. I mean, you have an African unit, union, so if you would work deeper in these regards. But I think it's really up to the next generation to, to define this, this goal all Africans or most of the Africans can unite behind. And, uh, to, and that's, what I, that's what I tried to explain earlier on, to be self-confident and to be, feel strongly about your own identity. Mm. So, yeah. Okay, back to feminism. Mm. We touched a bit earlier. Um, do you think women need to be ruthless and tough to have the seats at the table? Hmm. That is a good question. I mean, I think there are many different strategies uh, to get the seat at the table to become powerful. I don't know if women have to be tougher. I still think uh, they have to be better uh, than the average man to gain power because they're judged very often really more harshly and I think if uh, it's, it's enough to be, for a man to be as good, but it's so good, but a woman has to be really better to get the job. Um, maybe, you know, women haven't learned these skills many boys learn on a soccer field or wherever just to bully their way through. So mm -hmm. uh, do we have to be tougher? I mean, I don't know, being in management, being a, a leader, is tough and uh, if you say yes to take on responsibility uh, responsibility it's not only fun you know you really are responsible for people uh, for the economic growth uh, of your company but also for the you know for the well-being of your employees so if I talk to younger women uh, I say you know if you if you want to become a leader you have to be very aware that it's not only fun and, and flying nice planes or having big cars or making good money. You wake up at night and think, wow, this is my responsibility. It's on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. It's good. I like it. I love it. Uh, but it is, it's, it is a tough job. So, yes, I think you have to be tough however you act that out. Mm. Talking about tough jobs and decision making, I'd like to touch on the partnerships DWU has with various NGOs. How do you balance um, the perspective and the storytelling? Mm, that's, uh, we really have to be careful not uh, to get biased, right? To be on one side. So I think if we, uh, if we cover a story like, let's say, is, is this color of the table beautiful or not, uh, you should have someone in this report who says it's beautiful and someone who says it's not beautiful. That's a little bit of a stupid example. But, you know, I mean, I th what, I th what I want to say is you really should get both perspectives. Or sometimes it's actually even three perspectives in a report. So is it okay that Donald Trump, President Trump, is visiting President Modi right now in India? Uh, because there is a big discussion about uh, racism and xenophobia going on. So I think you have to talk to people who say, yes, it's the right move. And then you also have to bring in the critics in your shows. 
So um, that's the same when it comes to NGOs. You know, we shouldn't just give them a platform. We also have to challenge them. Even so, we might think uh, uh, they're taking the right stance. They're fighting for human rights or gender equality. But we still, uh, you know, we shouldn't become an NGO. We are still journalists fighting the good fight, but we always have to try to stand on neutral ground in our reporting. Thank you so much for your time, Ines. Thank you so much. All right. We've been chatting with Ines Paul. She's the editor-in-chief at DW. Thank you for watching Plus TV Africa. To catch up on this conversation and other interesting conversations such as this, do visit our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. And do remember to subscribe. My name is Elsie Godwin. Do stay with us.